The next bill we're going to take up is House Bill H565, a House resolution respectfully requesting an assessment of the benefits to Rhode Island of enactment of a Green New Deal, including, but not limited to, findings and recommendations for state legislation based on Green New Deal principles. We have, again, we have three pages of people signed up, and unfortunately, because of the late hour, there are so many people that have left. I'm going to call up the three people I see that I've circled to say that they were going to testify. If all three of you can come up at one time, and we'll just get it. Kevin Descato, Alex Kithis, and Michael Rolls, if you can all come up and take a seat and whoever would like to start state your name please for the record but no. oh here we go uh, I just want to thank you all for still sticking around we're all in this together and uh, thank you for your patience um, I'm gonna try to be brief best I can uh, I'm Michael Rolls uh, and I am the project manager for the uh, Rhode Island Green New Deal Research Council uh, we are a, a, a collaboration of uh, academics, researchers, community members, and civic leaders. And we are, uh, our work is charged with examining uh, the ideas behind this whole national dialogue of a Green New Deal uh, and examining what it is, really, and how it is appropriate to meet the needs of Rhode Island. Um, we know that Rhode Island is already experiencing uh, the impacts of climate change through sea level rise. Ocean warming is threatening our fishing industry. This, you know, marine life is moving north or it's, or it's going extinct. Uh, we are also seeing more frequent floods and heat waves, which is uh, you know, uh, an impact on our communities. Um, and, you know, also we are experiencing a lot of economic uncertainty. Rhode Island is usually the first to fall into a recession. It's usually the last to climb out. Um, so there is an urgency to examine creative solutions. And this whole idea of a Green New Deal is something that we are working to examine through uh, three ways. One is uh, through looking at the data where are, we are assessing existing studies and reports done by the, uh, admin, the agencies and the, ex, and the administrative branch. Uh, we are looking at the um, uh, studies done by other academia, whether it's the Coastal Resources Center at URI, uh, studies at Brown, studies at Rhode Island College, a lot of different studies on climate change, a lot of economic assessments of our different sectors and the active industries that are, are active in Rhode Island. Uh, so we are doing all of that and doing a lot of analysis on how these sort of principles behind a Green New Deal would affect and influence a lot of the economic and social factors of Rhode Island. Uh, the other way that we're approaching our work is through a lot of community engagement. Obviously, you know, the best solutions and the best uh, input did it? Did, oh, sorry. The, the best input comes from folks who are working on the ground, uh, whether that's business interests, whether that's uh, frontline communities, whether that's folks who have been left behind, middle class, blue collar folks, people who are on public assistance. Uh, we are working to engage a wide swath of folks on input on on the activities um, that or the experiences of folks on the ground and how Green New Deal uh, ideas would you know impact them in a positive way or a negative way. And through this work, we want to inform on. Uh, uh, what kind of creative solutions we can develop together uh, and, and bring that forth uh, to the legislature, to the governor, and, and make recommendations of what works and what's appropriate for Rhode Island uh, if we wanted, and if we wanted to pursue uh, these ideas. I mean, this, this urgency calls for an obligation that we examine every creative possible way uh, to make sure that our economy is working and that Rhode Island's future has, is resilient and thriving and positive and working for everybody. Uh, so that, so this, this resolution essentially just establishes some connectivity between our work and the legislature and the governor and the, the Department of Commerce, and you'll see it all stipulated in that, uh, that resolution, you know, that the sort of folks who uh, would receive our, our data and, 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 and feedback on the uh, community engagement that we've been doing. Um, and I'm open to any questions. I don't know if you want to talk, hear from these folks first or? Yes, thank you very much. Um, we will hold all questions till the three of you have spoken them. We'll, in case one of the three of you want to answer the question compared to the other. So I don't know who wants to go next, Alex Great, or Mr. Dakota. 
Thank you. Proceed, Alex. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so my name is Alex Kithis. Uh, I'm a member of Climate Action Rhode Island and Sunrise Rhode Island, but I'm not speaking on behalf of either of them. Um, so just first quick side note, you should have written testimony from Timmins Roberts. He just wanted me to, me to verify that uh, in support of this. So I know you've been here a long time, and I'll make this very quick. Um, climate change is an urgent threat to our well-being as a species. Uh, it's going to require bold solutions. And if we approach it correctly, solving this problem can foster economic growth and you know the growth in jobs and protect the most vulnerable members of our community all simultaneously. Uh, the National Green New Deal has proposed a list of objectives that would approach the problem of climate change uh, at the scale and on the timeline appropriate to the problem while also providing for those other interests. Uh, we have to figure out what that that concept of a Green New Deal looks like on the state level uh, and it looks like what it would look like to implement in Rhode Island um, based on our unique you know demographics and geography and and environment and everything uh, so the research that's being requested by this resolution will be um, invaluable to our state uh, and to you know to to the government to the EC4 um, and to our understanding of the solutions and the effects of climate change in Rhode Island uh, so that's why I'm here tonight urging you to pass this resolution. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Alex. Proceed, sir. My name's Kevin Dakota. I'm a lifelong Rhode Islander, or Rhode Islander, I should say. Um, I'll try to keep it pretty brief. I'm fairly tired and in a bit of pain, um, and I'm not used to speaking in front of people, so please bear with me. Um, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, so I think I may be going to talk in a little bit different terms. Um, I work in home care, uh, health care, and uh, work with a lot of people with asthma, COPD, congestive heart failure. Um, and I think, and there's you know, a lot of things too. I don't work in pediatrics, but you know, obviously things like lead poisoning and you know, over the years we've banned things like PCBs and you know, thalidomide. There's, all, there's, you know, there's, there's obviously a government role here. Um, a lot of the people I work with are on oxygen. Last year, the Rhode Island Department of Health issued a report um, basically kind of showing where the highest asthma rates were no surprise, Providence, Pawtucket, Central Falls, Woonsocket, I think Warwick and West Warwick, mostly in the industrialized zones. Um, people I work with just getting from the bed to a commode might exhaust them for half a day or a whole day. During the summer, we have ozone alert days it's more and more frequently, I think. Um, I mean, I don't remember an ozone alert day when I was a kid. Maybe they had them, I don't know. Um, makes it much worse. Even myself, I notice in air conditioning on those days, it's harder for me to do things. Um, these are very vulnerable people that I work with. You know, pollution is bad. We talk about carbon, but it's really more than carbon. It's, it's ozone, it's uh, particulates, and, you know, a whole bunch of other things that I'm not an expert on. But, you know, you wouldn't sit in your garage with the car on, you know, normally, with the garage door down. It's not a good thing to do. I, you know, we know this. This stuff is bad for us. Uh, over the years, it's, it's, it's in the soil. I think that's a big part of why it's in these areas, like... Uh, you know, the urban areas, the industrial areas, along the rivers a lot of times, too. Um, and you, when you work in healthcare, especially some of my colleagues that work with pediatrics, they, they, they really see where it does really turn up in these, in these industrial areas, um, um, which unfortunately, you know, for people like me that can afford air conditioning or, or to move, even though I will never leave <laughs> Rhode Island, much to my wife's chagrin, uh, and I love living in Providence, and I probably will never leave Providence either. Uh, not everybody has that choice. Some people, you know, just due to economics or circumstances, they don't have that choice, or they're, you know, like the people I work with, they're elderly, they don't have good mobility, and we don't really see those people because they don't go out, they live in nursing homes, they live in high-rises, they're not marching in the streets. 
they, most of them, they're just trying to get through the day. They're not really able to focus on these kind of bigger environmental issues. Um, we hear a lot about costs. Everyone's got to say, you know, we can't afford to do this. We can't afford to do that. But really, we, I believe we, cannot, we can't afford not to do it. Uh, when you factor in the cost of hospitalizations, long-term care for people with, with these conditions, asthma, and again, it's all concentrated in these industrial zones by the highways. Um, you know, if you look at that report from the Rhode Island Department of Health, it really goes into detail about the, a lot of those costs. Uh, one thing I came across in my, uh, I, I don't use Google, but we'll call it a Google uh, 10, well, where is it? $7.9 million grant to Lifespan to address asthma. And that's just in Rhode Island, in one, one little ho hospital group. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, and again, it relates to cost, is just kind of sort of what you could call progress. You know, again, the Green New Deal is very broad and kind of, I mean, I don't remember. I wasn't alive during the original New Deal, and most, a lot of people don't even know what it is if you talk to them, but it really is, was a transformative thing. Um, you know, I think if, if, it, the, if, the, if the old days were today, there would be the covered wagon, Institute and the uh, covered wagon wheel horse drawn carriage manufacturer guild that would be opposing, you know, this type of le legislation. But, you know, cars came along, railroads came along, electricity, all those things, and even the internal, co internal combustion engine, which, you know, we now know has, is problematic. People were opposed to those, they exploded. You know, people thought it was dangerous, but eventually it became part of, you know, the way we live today. Um, and I think now we sort of have a chance to, to get it right. You know, we can design a new system or we can fall into second or even third world status. If we want to progress and be, you know, right up there with other countries that are investing in, you know, new technologies, or we can just keep, you know, have a T system that looks like the uh, Siberian Railroad. It's so old, it's like a trip uh, back in time. Um, but anyway, uh, just to wrap up, I don't think we can wait for the federal uh, leadership at the federal level, because it's just not gonna happen. Um, I think if enough states, just like when prohibition ended, enough states get together, eventually you get some momentum and things can change. But we really should have done this uh, 50 years ago, um, and if you have a minute, I'll just read a little bit of a memo uh, from a White House memo, as with, uh, it reads, as with so many of the more interesting environmental questions, we really don't have satisfactory measurements of the carbon dioxide problem. On the other hand, this very clearly is a problem, and perhaps most particularly is one that can seize the imagination of persons normally indifferent to projects of apocalyptic change. Uh, the process is a simple one. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has the effect of a pane of glass in a greenhouse. Uh, or in today's standards, I guess you could say leaving a child or dog or anybody in a car with the windows up during the summer. Uh, it, it goes on, I won't read you the whole thing, but I will tell you the date was September 17th, 1969 the year before I was born, and the problem was known then. It could have been addressed all those many years ago, but now there's no more time to wait, in my opinion, and maybe it's too late already. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cotto. Any questions for these three witnesses? Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony. And thank yes, you. we have plenty of testimony, written testimony here, um, and we will be perusing it as we go along in that. So um, is there anyone else that wants to speak on House Bill 5665? I see there's a few more in the audience. I don't know if they're here for this bill or another bill. So I would say there isn't. So we will end the hearing on House Bill H5665. Our next